Millions of people drive across the Golden Gate Bridge. Millions more walk it. But few, even Bay Area natives, sail under it. Having done so on a commercial tour boat as its only passengers, and been thrilled by the experience, I leapt at the chance to return for more, when my friend Peter German invited me to join him and his friend Michael Solomon for a sail on a clear summer's day. We set out from Brickyard Cove in Point Richmond, an amiably slow-moving neighborhood nestled on a hill across from the vast Chevron refinery. Peter's sailboat is a 30-foot skiff named I own by its previous owner. I own, get it? Peter quipped. I own it. But you know the old sailor's lament. The best two days in a sailor's life are the days he buys his boat and the day he sells it. The winds were light coming out of the cove, but once we passed out of the lee of Angel Island, we were met by a stiff midday breeze funneling through the gate. I own picked up speed, tacking into the wind. The gate loomed in the distance as we sailed past Alcatraz and into view of familiar San Francisco landmarks. I'm a kayaker by predilection, addicted to its slocomotion as it moves at the speed of a moderate walk. I love being down in my bottom nestled at water level, my arms in a rhythmic swirl, my hips swiveling in sync with the kayak's dance on the sway of the water. I love the kayak's simplicity. As one friend observed, not so many things to maintain or break. You're the only moving part. Sailboats, on the other hand, demand your attention at most all moments, both under sail and at dock. Lots of moving parts, not least of all the sailor. But I could be persuaded to become a sailor myself. The hiss of the water, the lean of the boat as the wind catches the sails, the exhilaration of riding a stiff breeze. I agree with the water rat, better known as Ratty, who remarks to the mole in that rhapsodic children's story, The Wind in the Willows. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats simply messing. Then, as he capsizes, he continues, about in boats, or with boats, in or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. As we approach the gate, it looms ever larger, and from this angle, still more lovely than from above. Set against a piercing blue sky, its wine-hued structure takes my breath away but I'm told it's actually international orange, the color select to best resist rust from the frequent fogs that enshroud it. On its 75th anniversary, one reputable historian called it one of the great wonders of the world, right up there with the pyramids. But unlike the pyramids and most other such wonders, it's highly functional carrying tens of thousands of passengers and pedestrians across the straits each day. Sometimes I try to visualize what this Golden Gate Strait must have looked like before the bridge was built. And for once, I believe that we humans have actually improved upon nature. It's like a double exclamation point exulting at the beauty of the bay. As we pass under the gate, I sense the energy shifting. The wind bellows in our ears as we move through the Straits Funnel and out towards the open ocean. It's somehow calmer here, with seaborne long swells replacing the chop of the bay. Under this gate pass all the giant freighters sailing in from the Orient. They supply the West with imported electronics, food, cars, clothing, and who knows what all, while on their return they carry American goods back to the East its global commerce at its most prosaic. Yet as they pass through this majestic gate, there's a moment of pure poetry. Once in a long ago prehistory, 
The westernmost reach of the continent extended all the way to the Fairlawns, and the Golden Gate Strait was a giant cascade waterfall. San Francisco Bay itself was a great plain, lush with wetlands, migratory birds, woolly mammoths, mastodons, and American lions. Hard to believe that as recently as the 1960s, the bay was rapidly shrinking to the dimensions of a river as the cities on its shores dumped untreated sewage and landfill to make room for more subdivisions. Only through the efforts of Save the Bay in an unlikely campaign launched by three women in the Berkeley Hills is San Francisco Bay today a recovering ecosystem clean enough for swimmers with more than a hundred parks and reserves along its shoreline. Returning under the bridge, we head for the ferry building, itself a remarkable revival of a once fading landmark. We tie up at a nearby berth, sip coffee as we watch strollers feasting eyes and stomachs on Epicurean delights, and relaunch for a leisurely sail home. The breezes are now behind us, and we let out the jib and mainsail to catch a ride back to Point Richmond. Practically without our notice, a giant freighter appears to starboard and lumbers past, navigating the final few miles of its long journey from the Orient. With its immense mass, I find myself wondering how it can even float. We're a mere wood chip on the waves next to this hulk of iron and steel. I'm strangely comforted by being so inconsequential, much as I am when contemplating our infinitesimal human presence in the infinite ocean of the cosmos. We pull into Brickyard Cove as a setting sun burnishes the marina in a gentling light. It may be that for sailboat owners, the first and last day are the best. But for we who hitch a ride with them, a day on the bay like this is great good fortune. I thank my friends Peter and Michael for time well spent messing about in a boat. And I thank the bay and the gate for reminding me of the glory of it all. We humans have made a fine mess of so many things. But in this particular case, after doing so much wrong, we seem to have gotten it mostly right.